Hello and good afternoon. My name is Enrique Hasso. I'm the director of the Texas Medical and Dental Schools Application Service here at the Texas Health Education Service Office in Austin, Texas. Uh, and welcome to today's uh, panel of uh, some of our medical schools here at TMDSAS. Joining me today uh, from our office is Catherine Schlegel, who will be helping us in the background to collect your questions. So Catherine, thanks for joining us. I'm gonna send you off into the background now, thank you. Uh, so as you have any questions for our panelists today, uh, please feel free to drop them into the chat on Facebook, on YouTube or on Twitter, and we'll collect those and address the questions as they come in. So. Uh, this is your time. We're all here for you and your questions. Uh, but before we get started, let's uh, meet uh, some of our panelists. So we'll get started here uh, left to right, uh, starting with Dr. Brandt. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Brandt. I am the uh, Interim Associate Dean for Admissions at uh, Texas A&M now School of Medicine. Uh, we generally admit about 200 folks per year. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Texas A&M is one of the largest universities in the country. We have about 69,000 students. Um, and uh, we look forward to hopefully interviewing you this uh, fall. Enrique, back to you. Thank you. Uh, next is, is uh, Dr. Rubin. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, the chair of the admissions committee at UT Southwestern in Dallas. Um, I'm a professor of internal medicine, and actually I'm just the chair of the committee. We don't have a dean of admissions, and I uh, look forward to trying to answer all your questions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kennedy. Uh, you're on mute, Dr. Kennedy. I'm muted. Now I'll talk. Uh, my name is Mike Kennedy. I am the assistant dean for admissions at the Texas College osteopathic medicine. So you're at the UNT Health Science Center in Fort Worth. And I uh, want to thank you for coming today and thank TMDSAS for hosting this. Thank you. Dr. Perry. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Cynthia Perry. I'm the Associate Dean for Admissions and Associate Professor in the Department of Medical Education at the Foster School of Medicine. Uh, we are part of uh, TTU HSC El Paso. And I'm excited to share information about our institution, our academic program, and um, help everyone out that is joining us today. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Calloway. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be um, here with you all today. I'm Dr. Judy Ann Kellaway. Um, I'm the Associate Dean for Admissions and Outreach at the Long School of Medicine. We're in San Antonio. Y'all need to come visit San Antonio's great place. Uh, to see other things besides the Alamo. Anyway, we're looking forward to answering all your questions and helping you along this um, uh, arduous path that you're on as a pre-med. Wonderful, thank you all so much. And as we mentioned, uh, we are here to address your questions. So uh, feel free to start uh, sending us your comments uh, in the, in the uh, chat for Facebook or YouTube where you are watching. Uh, to kick us off today, uh, we're going to start with one of our most popular questions that we get here at TMDSAS, uh, and it's regarding activities. Uh, for prospective applicants, which activities, internships, shadowing experiences, uh, et cetera, would you suggest help applicants gain the most experience to becoming competitive? So I'll let that, uh, I'll let uh, the most eager to answer that uh, jump in first. Well, I'll, <laughs> you know, that's a very broad question. And um, I think a um, sort of relates to the this um, concept of a holistic approach to applications. Um, you know, there are many different aspects. I think we can go on and on about specific activities. But I think what we look for <clears throat> is sort of the depth and breadth, or rather the depth of the specific activity um, as opposed to somebody spending an hour or two, you know, here and there and not getting any true experience and how that, you know, you need to think back, reflect how that may impact um, your uh, either interactions with other individuals or an experience that touches you that, you know, might relate to medicine. And that could be 
quite broad. It might be, you know, being part of a team in an activity, you know, for a volunteer group, uh, uh, or it could be, you know, in a healthcare setting, but not necessarily. So it's a very, I think, the sort of the quality of the interactions and the depth of your experience and how to reflect what you learn from that. And then thinking about how could this inform me in terms of interacting with other human beings and certainly, you know, as being a physician. So, um, you know, it's a very broad question you asked there. And there's, there's many ways, I think, to answer that. But again, we look more not, I think the take home is look at something you're passionate about and pursue it. And, and we, as my, you know, you talk to one committee, uh, you, you, you know, our committees are very broad. There's different perspectives. There's different perspectives on each committee that complicates things. But I think we really want to see, you know, what did you get out of it versus uh, there are applicants who spend literally a couple of hours here and there. It's hard to imagine getting anything out of that. So I'll stop there and I'm sure my colleagues have other things to add. I, I would like to add that um, a couple of things. First off, um, well, I agree, depth is critical. These one hour knockoffs, just we, we want to see that you're really involved in something. I think that's common for all of us. But for me and, and our admissions committee and our interviewers, what we're looking for also is, at least in the healthcare re region or area, is that you have proven to yourself that this is really what you want to do, that you have gone in and found out. You know, I always tell every applicant I interview, medicine is messy. And um, you have to convince yourself that it's not all birthing babies, perfect babies every day. Uh, it is sad, it's frustrating, and you have to be aware of that. And you have, to, we, I wanna see that you've determined that for yourself. So that's, that's, it's, that's some of the, maybe the, if you will, a little bit of the darker side of the admissions process, but it's important that you know who you are and what you want. Great, thank you. Uh, any other comments? All right. Well, we've started collecting uh, quite a few questions here, so we're gonna go ahead and dig in. Uh, our first question from, uh, from the group, uh, my question concerns out-of-state admissions. From my, from my research, the numbers I've seen for admitted out-of-state students hasn't been particularly encouraging. Are non-Texans encouraged to apply? I'll, I'll get us started on that. So um, we are regulated by the state of Texas um, to limit out-of-staters to 10% of our um, student enrollment. Um, I'm going to speak for Long School of Medicine and let other people either thumbs up or change the message, but we love our out-of-staters and, and the out-of-state students that we get bring all kinds of new diversity from their experiences and their backgrounds, mm -hmm. and we think it's a good thing. And so in, at Long School of Medicine, we will fill our full 10% and sometimes even a little more, but don't tell the senators, right? Don't tell the legislature. But anyway, we do love our out-of-staters. And I think that there are some people trying to work on changing that metric, which personally I think is sort of an old, you know, that that law is when people weren't so mobile. And now our, our Texas residents go elsewhere and people from, you know, we see applicants from all over the place. So uh, yes, non-Texans uh, are encouraged to apply. Um. Just speaking for for TCOM on this one is that there, uh, yeah, we we like non-residents for many of the reasons Dr. Kellaway talked about. They have a new perspective to come in. Um, they um, they enrich they enrich the class. They're very strong students. Usually for us, particularly, they're interested in our school. Sometimes very specifically when they apply. So so many students may apply specifically just to a select out of states uh, Texas schools they're interested in. But I think it's worth applying. There's not that many out of state applicants that apply to TMDSAS to begin with. And 10% of the spots that are available in Texas that say we're all state schools here, that's still a lot of numbers. Uh, seats here available, potentially you have a chance to get into. And uh, we're certainly looking at people that may want to make Texas their home, though I think that's, you know, has some ties to this community uh, somewhere in the state. So we're always have a little bias there in our, our process, but 
again, uh, well, you know, we've had students from Alaska, we've had students from Maine, um, uh, from all points in between the Midwest, the, you know, other parts of the South and the Rocky Mountain region. So we're always excited to bring them there. I would add to, and then there's another question later on about this, um, any recommendations for out-of-state applicants. Um, we do because we recognize that we have a limited number of seats for out-of-state students. So accordingly, we only set aside a number of interviews for out-of-state applicants. So I think more than anything else for those that are not Texas residents, it's really important to get your application in early because we do screen those separately and consider them for uh, a separate number of slots. So for us, we usually invite the majority of our out-of-state applicants earlier in the cycle. Um, and, and I understand it's a very competitive pool for those that are out of state, um, but uh, I would echo that we really do um, like our out-of-state applicants and definitely we always fill that, that quota that we have. We just dropped a link uh, into the chat for you to uh, visit the uh, statistics dashboard that we've created where we've captured the past 10 years of uh, admissions data for all of our medical schools. Uh, and you can actually uh, see how competitive you are as an out-of-state applicant by taking a look at that dashboard. It's fully interactive. So you can look at GPA, look at MCAT scores, uh, across the board uh, and kind of see how competitive you might be uh, among the uh, the out-of-state pool. But most importantly, you can also see the numbers that uh, this group has been referring to. Uh, and those do off, uh, include all uh, first-year medical students. So that would include MD-PhD students. Uh, so you're going to see some of those groups included on there as well. But it's a really helpful tool if you're out-of-state uh, to kind of uh, see where you fit along the along that group. Uh, all right, so let's dig into our next question here. Uh, this is uh, from Angela. Uh, for the schools that are doing fully inter uh, fully virtual interviews, are there any opportunities to speak with medical school students or visit the campus? And before we jump into that. Uh, I have to ask, uh, for this next application cycle, uh, how many of you are continuing all virtual uh, or perhaps going all in person? So let's start all virtual. Okay, and any in person? Excellent. Actually, I have to qualify. One of our groups is doing all in person. And Med is doing all in person. Mm -hmm. so. and, and of course here, we're, we're only seeing a sample of, of five of our medical schools. Uh, you ask uh, 13 medical schools and you're going to get 13 responses. So uh, uh, now, that, now that we kind of are aware of, uh, of the makeup of, of our panel here, um, for those doing fully virtual interview uh, uh, activities, uh, what opportunities are there for students to visit with students? Sure. After, uh, after we've made our pre-match offers, we usually have a series of uh, sessions during the weekends um, on Saturday mornings uh, and into the afternoon. Uh, called a second visit or second look where students who can come and visit uh, the school and see what they like. Right now, we're just limiting that to Bryan College Station. I'm going to try to move that up to Dallas uh, and uh, uh, next year and maybe Houston and eventually Round Rock. Uh, but for now, it's going to be in College Station and maybe Dallas next year. I'll go ahead and jump in. Is that okay? Um, we're going to have, um, we opened our campus visit program last October in the cycle. Um, didn't have too much activity until after, but um, the we will have campus visits for anybody who wants to visit our school. So whether you're a pre-med or you're in the cycle and haven't been invited yet, or you have, you have been interviewed or even accepted, you're welcome to come to a campus visit. In the upcoming cycle, always, that will continue. Um, and then in the upcoming sample, we're doing a virtual interview day. And there are uh, several opportunities to interact with um, our students during that time. There's a huddle where it's like a, a medical student panel, all levels are represented, and then the students do the um, a live guided 
virtual tour. And then at the end of the day, there is a chance to go visit with some organizations, kind of like a mini fair, a mini organization fair. Um, but we're also, so that's the virtual interview day. We'll also have twice a month um, invitations to people who have interviewed to come have our famous pasta bar lunch and, you know, have a live tour and visit the, it's a nice luncheon hosted by our faculty and students. So we've, um, during the pandemic, things have, have changed. There's lots of things we've learned about um, in our processes. So we used to have a day and a half uh, um, visit during interviews. Uh, we've changed that. We'll continue to have virtual interviews. Part of it's just uh, being equitable for people, various finances to have the same level field in terms of, of, of opportunities. Uh, we thought it was unfair to, you know, some can visit, others couldn't in terms of the formal sort of interview process. So we'll continue to have virtual interviews. During that session though, it's a Saturday morning. So it's a four hour session. You'll only be interviewed by uh, two faculty members for half an hour each. So the rest of that time is what was already sort of addressed. Uh, we'll have small breakout sessions and other sort of more intimate uh, interactions with other students and so forth. Uh, what we've switched to though is we'll have formal, as was alluded to, a uh, second visit. So for those who are offered uh, admission, we'll, we will have a very a specific uh, programming of on-site um, tours uh, and, and visits uh, to our facilities and so forth. But those now will be restricted to those who, who uh, receive uh, uh, offers of admission. Um, you're always welcome to call or to, to contact the admissions office uh, to have more informal uh, interactions or, or visits, but uh, there will not be an organized uh, program outside of what I just mentioned. So. I would say that during our interview process, which uh, the virtual one, we do set up uh, an hour during the lunch session uh, for you to visit with our students. We have a student panel uh, of maybe M2s and M3s that are uh, of about maybe six or seven folks to uh, give you a sense of what what the students think of the school. Great, thank you. Um, and so our next question is going to uh, Dr. Kennedy. Uh, unfortunately, you are the sole representative for early decision programs. So <laughs> this question is going strictly to you. Uh, for schools that participate in uh, early decision programs, is there a set number of seats or interviews versus normal cycle applicants? Uh, Zachary, I can only speak for us. Uh, we don't have a limitation on number of seats, interviews, or acceptances that can come from early decision. I'm going to guess to say the other programs are probably pretty similar, uh, although I probably can't really be sure of RGV because it's a small class size down there. Um, but we've never had a, a limitation. Uh, if you're very interested in a particular school and you want to show it, show that uh, is the case, um, certainly you can apply early decision. Just be sure to indicate in your application why you think that school specifically is your school, the end all be all medical schools to come to. I think that's an important part on, on at least on the receiving end of an application, what we, what we would like to know. Um, 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 I think that's a, a major factor with all other factors being considered. Great, thank you. And, and of course, uh, uh, University of North Texas uh, Health Science Center, TCOM, is one of three member institutions that uh, have early, early decision programs. Uh, and as, as we mentioned, if you have questions about uh, early decision program, please visit our website. We have some information on there to uh, kind of walk you through what that process would look like. Uh, we're going to go ahead and segue a little bit back toward um, GPA and, and conversations about being competitive applicants. Um, uh, based off of some of the questions here. Uh, so uh, here's one from Anusha. Hi, thanks so much for doing this. We really appreciate your time. What is your advice to lower stat applicants who might fall below your median MCAT or GPA? 
Um, I could jump in on this one. So I would say um, really think about the individual programs and mission alignment. Um, if you feel that maybe um, based on your academic metrics, you think that you're, you know, not as competitive as your peers, I would say there's a ton of other ways to distinguish yourself and really focus on that. We're looking, um, again, we talked about holistic review and the metrics is just one component of what we're looking at. Um, and for us, that's really a preliminary consideration, right? Do we feel like you meet the threshold to be successful moving forward and be a successful medical student? And beyond that, we really wanna see um, who you are and what your story is and how you'll fit within our program and, and um, within the class that we're building. And so I think there's a lot of other ways to work on how to distinguish yourself um, as far as making yourself competitive, because for from our perspective, competitiveness um, and a holistic applicant um, isn't just about the numbers. So it's about your experiences and what else you bring to the table. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Dr. Perry touched on it quite well. Um, think about this. So when you're saying uh, the median. So there's obviously people below the median that are getting in. So don't don't use median or mean as a cutoff to thinking that's the only way uh, those are the numbers it takes to get into that particular school. Because we'll look at candidates that uh, have like below a B average. Uh, typically, these are candidate applicants who have gone back to school, re kind of rebuilt their academic credentials. Uh, they may have taken the MCAT repeatedly. So there's a lot of variances there. Um, to what an, a, the median or the mean is going to represent what just statistically what that's going to represent for the class. So, um, you know, take a look at, you know, there's some breadth in there, um, uh, flexibility, but at some point you do have to demonstrate that you're, uh, we reasonably believe you could be successful in our curriculum. Okay. I, I agree completely with what's been stated. Um, and, uh, you know, just to sort of add, um, you know, we, a couple of years ago, we really have moved away from fixed uh, numbers. And we do want to, as was alluded to, uh, make sure that uh, an individual will be academically successful. I mean, there's no question about it. The medical school curriculum, uh, I think, challenges virtually everybody, even those who've had outstanding undergraduate careers, you know, off and, and are over, maybe confident you know, are often very challenged. So we want you to be successful. Uh, but once we um, believe that you'll be successful academically, you know, the numbers we don't pay attention to anymore and look for all the other features or aspects of an applicant in terms of becoming a successful uh, physician. Uh, it's, it's a complicated formula. I mean, you could be, as was alluded to, somebody who maybe uh, uh, had a difficult start and then you know, went back to school and was very successful, you know, weighing uh, those who have lower GPAs from academically more demanding programs. Uh, so again, their GPA may be lower, but um, you know, the rigor of their program is higher. We take that into account. So we don't have a fixed number. We do offer admissions to individuals with the whole spectrum of MCATs and GPAs. And, um, you know, uh, we just want to make sure you're successful. And obviously, um, uh, you know, that's not always possible. We're continuously trying to figure that out and are, are very sensitive to the different circumstances individuals may have. Wonderful, thank you. So uh, we have a couple of questions that came up that I think uh, I should be the one to address on the statistics dashboard that was shared earlier. The GPAs that are calculated are actually flat GPA grades. So some institutions will use plus or minus. TMDSAS does not uh, use plus or minus grading. However, in your application, you have to enter your courses exactly as they appear on your transcript. So uh, that was one question that came in there. And then the next one here, uh, are we able to send MCAT scores after submitting our, our primary TMDSAS applications? How soon do most schools prefer to have them by? I can address the technical question about applying. Uh, you can submit your TMDSAS application prior to having your MCAT scores. 
Once those come in, uh, it takes about 36 hours from the point that you release them to TMDSAS to the point that our schools are able to see them on their end. Um, is there any comment on uh, preference for uh, when you would see uh, an MCAT score? Well, I think everybody usually says the sooner the better, but I would caution people, you know, not to rush through that. Um, our school does screening from June and in, we invite people for interviews starting in July and invite all the way up until January. So we do look at the last administration of the MCAT um, test in September. We do look at the results from that. Thank you. Uh, and in a similar vein, uh, we, of course, now we're getting a ton of MCAT questions. Um, how do admissions committees view multiple MCAT scores? There's somebody who may have had to retake the MCAT several times. We only look at the highest uh, MCAT. Yeah, we're the same here at a &M. We take the highest score. That's what we do. I, I think sometimes it also can be a demonstration of um, dedication and motivation and persistence. You know, uh, we have a lot of reapplicants all the time in the cycle, and people are trying to better themselves. So, I would I would add to along with that, um, if we see an applicant that has repeated attempts um, with either minimal change or on the other end um, with a dramatic change. Um, I love to see that discussed somewhere. So what do you think your particular challenges are and what have you learned from that experience? Um, if you did have an improvement, you know, what did you change? How do you think that will apply to your future as a successful medical student? Um, have you rethought your study process, all those kinds of things? So, um, you know, I always tell applicants if there's things that you think might be um, a, a flag or something like that, then just address it up front. Um, and that's always the best approach. I, I would agree with that. And everything else is said, it's your highest score is your score. Uh, we do have the history and, and sometimes, yes, it does show persistence if you're continuing to work to improve um, and it's telling us your strengths and weaknesses, kind of giving us a parameter of where you kind of lie in that. Just what it is, is, is a standardized test score. I mean, there's going to be, a, you know, you want to do your best on that. Um, you know, we have, but we have scores in pretty, it's, I would say it's much more, I, I assume a lot of you have the same thing. We have a very normalized distribution with our mean being in the middle and to a bell curve all the way through. So we have students in the high numbers, lower numbers. Um, so there's a lot of different kind of ranges, but the mean tends to be the gravitational center of our score scoring range. And while we're talking about MCAPs, for us, we tend to, of all the subsections, we tend to put a little bit more emphasis on cars. I can't speak for anybody else, but we just find we have no no data to confirm this. But intuitively, we we have a feeling that folks who have a higher score, have better car score, tend to perform well in the curriculum once they get here. It's just an an impressionistic uh, viewpoint. But because of that, our committee looks at the car score. Yeah, for sort of singles it out. Thank you. Uh, we have a, on the, on the same topic of MCAT, uh, if I take my MCAT at the end of May and submit my primaries at the end of June, is that considered too late for the application cycle? So uh, removing some of the conditional stuff here, uh, at, at what, uh, applying early is an important message for our medical applicants and balancing a quality application with applying early in the cycle is important. Uh, what advice do you have for applicants uh, as they're trying to figure out what their personal timeline for applying is going to look like? I think the answer is always as soon as possible, yeah. reasonably. But don't sacrifice quality. Yeah. I'm sure Dr. Brandt would agree. Absolutely. Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes people 
don't do a very thorough job on their applications, just get them done early. And that's that's one of the biggest mistakes. We'll see typographical errors, spelling. Uh, I mean, I've even you even see the name of the physician you were shadowing is misspelled, <laughs> or, or or information that's omitted, or information things that happened in the past or future tense dated, um, all all these sort of errors. And when somebody's feeding forward an application, so do, it's best to do a good job. I always kind of in a in an honest way, if you turn in later, that's fine. Here's the here's where the challenge comes. So I think everybody would hopefully everybody agrees. We start the season, all of us start with the season. We have so many people we can invite to interview. And as the season goes on, that number diminishes because we've already extended invitations out. So at the end of the cycle, if you're turning it in at the end, let's say I have 300 invitations left, but now I've got 2000 completed applications. <laughs> Whereas two months ago, I made had 700 invitations to extend and I had only a thousand applications completed. So my chances to spend time looking at your application, cycling it through reviews were multiple opportunities for an interview. Um, Cause it's sort of like a supply demand curve. And so at the end, we'll end up with 2,300 completed applications with the last 50 invites left. And that's where coming in at the last minute, you had fewer, less time in that cycle to be considered for an inter invite. And that get, it begins to hear a little bit of your challenge. Uh, but that varies from school to school. I, um, this is something I have kind of tell applicants why it's important to do it. But it's better to do a thorough job than it is to turn it in early and make so many mistakes because you can't go back and fix those errors at that point. So uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about our reapplicants, folks who have previously applied, uh, perhaps didn't get in, and are now looking to reapply to medical school. Uh, so our first question here uh, is uh, from uh, Christopher. As a Texas resident and reapplicant, is it encouraged to apply to every program in the state or just to select few? While while y'all fight on who's gonna who's going to take that one, uh, I I do want to remind everyone out there. TMDSAS uses a flat rate application fee. Whether you apply to one or all in member institutions, uh, you pay the two hundred dollar application fee. So, uh, and I think I, you just hit on it right there. And it, you've got what 14, 15 options. Right. You should you should use them all, especially mm -hmm. with virtual interviewing. It, it, it's so much of a benefit to the applicant now. So. Mm -hmm. And it's such a great value. I think uh, when we're looking at other application services, $200 sometimes doesn't even cover the fee to send your application to an additional institution. All right. Uh, so next question regarding reapplicants, is it generally encouraged to rewrite the personal statement? I don't plan on submitting the exact same essay, but my motivations are largely the same. You've had a year more of experience. You might have a lot more to say. Um, I think people on admissions committees and screening committees would be looking for what else you have to add. You know, I, I also think it's an opportunity for self-reflection and see, you know, read your prior statement and uh, maybe show it to somebody you know, uh, in your pre-med committee or, or a faculty member or coworker, depending upon your circumstances. And does it answer the question that, uh, that you're supposed to be answering? You know, usually a, a mission uh, or your post personal motivation, does it really reflect that? Um, and, you know, depending upon your conclusions, we'll answer the question, do you need to modify it or how much you should modify it? I think generally with um, all of our reapplicants, you um, should take every opportunity to um, improve any and all aspects that you can. And, um, you know, it's an extremely competitive um, situation. And um, so why leave anything on the table? Um, I would say, you know, any aspect of the application is 
um, fair game. And if you um, have an, an, any area that you can try to improve, um, I would suggest trying to do that. And so that includes essays as well. I would agree with that. <laughs> Nothing to add there. Yep. Okay. All right. We're getting quite a few questions now. Uh, so this one is in regards to MD, uh, MPH or DO MPH programs. Uh, we have several dual degree programs uh, that uh, are available through several of our uh, member institutions. With regards to MD MPH programs, uh, that would be specifically McGovern Medical School and Texas Tech uh, Lubbock that offers those programs. Unfortunately, they're not here at the panel. We have um, an MD MPH. Oh, we have yeah, I think MPH. MPH yeah. My apologies. Yeah, we, we do too, but we offer as part of the MD Plus program. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I, I, I will take back my statement and allow you all to answer. Um, yeah, so for us, um, we encourage students once they get um, an offer, uh, a first off offer, um, then they can apply um, to the MD MPH. Obviously, on the application, you can indicate your interests and plans to apply for that program as well. Um, but for specifically our MD MPH program, um, we ask that students um, wait to apply until they've got an offer from. Um, our MD program, and then they can apply to the joint program. That's what that's what we do as well. We use the SOFIS, the School of Public Health Application Service. It's a centralized service um, that the deadline, I'll just say this also, the deadline for that is in April, but um, we sort of ignore the deadline because we know there are going to be some offers out of the weight pool and those you know people interested are are also eligible at that time yeah and i just said i'll add that we do it the same way we, you uh, apply to the md program get admitted to it and then we you have the option of asking to uh, enroll in the md plus program and that's where it's a whole bunch of different master's degrees mph is one of them uh, where you will take you, your, you have your choice of either deferring for a year before you start med school to complete that program first, which is what most folks do, or after you sometimes after the pre clerkship uh, component of the curriculum, students will take a year off to do that master's degree uh, and uh, come back in and start in clinicals. All right, thank you. And we have a great question that came in while we were having a conversation about reapplicants. Uh, is it okay to work with a pre-health faculty advisor? Please. I think, I think it's yes. highly recommended to yes. work with your pre-health uh, faculty yes. advisor. So absolutely take advantage of all of the resources available on your campus to support you. Uh, and then uh, we had a question that came up about the wait list. When is the most movement seen on, on your wait list? This week. Yeah, <laughs> typically end of April through early June. Yes, and that, that has to do with the, the deadline for applicants to uh, narrow down their acceptances to one school. So uh, definitely there's a lot of movement that happens after the TMDSAS match. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, our next question is uh, about Casper. Uh, a lot of schools are moving toward Casper. How heavily do you weigh Casper scores? I think the Casper is not a matter of weight. I don't. We I, a lot of us. I'm. I'm gonna speak for us. And other people can chime in. Um, we use it impressionistically. So we have like hundreds of pieces of information about an applicant, and we use it as one additional piece. What it does for us, though, it does give us a chance to see an experience that all of the applicants have had. You know, there is a lot of variety in schools and GPAs and majors and, and things like that, but um, the MCAT is a standardized experience for everyone. And it's, um, you know, it tells us about some very, that third very important part of holistic review, which is your personal attributes. So I would 
take it seriously and do your best. Um, but it's, we don't use a formula or a matrix or anything like that. So we uh, look at it, but we do not weigh it heavily. And our own analysis for our applicants have shown a distinct difference between scores from underrepresented minorities and non uh, underrepresented minorities. And so we're very concerned about uh, the utility of that tool. Um, so we look at it, we're learning as we've done our own analyses, but we certainly do not uh, weigh it in our final decisions. Same for us, it's impressionistic. A very negative score does tend to get our attention, uh, but really it, it's a just impressionistic. All right, thank you. And uh, this was a follow-up question uh, when Dr. Perry brought up earlier the values and the mission for each school. So uh, this question is, uh, being brought to everyone, if you could name one quality your school values above all else, what would it be? Now the tables have turned. Uh, <laughs> you, you, asked, you asked this of applicants, and now the tables are turned. You know, I, I don't think there's uh, an answer. You know, at the end of the day, to cut through everything, you can ask yourself the question, would you want this individual to take care of your beloved family member and work with this person endless hours uh, or not? And I think that sort of gets through to what we're trying to get to. You know, who's going to be a great physician? Who would you want to take care of you if your life or your loved one's life was on the line? And there's many factors that go into that. So I'm not going to, I can't come up with one quality. It truly is a uh, sort of a broad approach with multiple people looking at the same question and issue and, and for us coming to a consensus. I think that's a great answer. Yeah, we have five, so I can't answer it with one <laughs> in our value statement. And uh, Actually, we ask a question about integrity. It's on our secondary. And that's one we did choose to ask applicants to kind of discuss how they've demonstrated integrity and give a sort of pseudo description. So that's one that we kind of really honed in on. I think I would say for us, um, it would be service. We have a huge focus um, on our campus about community engagement and um, being a resource to the community. And, um, and so we look for that kind of same characteristic in our applicants and our incoming students um, and just wanting to kind of be a part of that mission. For AM, we have our Aggie core values, of which there are six of them. And if you want to boil it down to, we can't boil it down to one, but if you had to, it would be integrity and honesty is, is probably the most important thing if you had to boil it down. Thank you. And uh, we've got a question here that's actually coming from uh, the TMDSCS support team. This is a question we get very often. Uh, and so we're gonna drop this as a banner. Uh, will a misdemeanor or academic dishonesty flag uh, show flag uh, in my application and prevent me from getting interview invites? So when an applicant discloses misdemeanor or academic dishonesty in their application, what, what does the process there look like? It can. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, I, I never want to say never, but, um, you know, there was an applicant this year that had a dishonesty thing and um, was accepted to medical school. Not, not it, going somewhere else, but not, not here. But we did look at them and we were really seriously considering. But it was a long road back from when that happened. I, I think that's important to point that out or um, a misdemeanor. It, sometimes these are learning experiences about character and, and again, integrity. Uh, it's about how you respond to those kind of situations where you put yourself, got yourself into, I shouldn't say put yourself, but you might have gotten into, um, you know, th those are things that our committee takes very seriously. Some, some things are by statute though on criminal, uh, 
issues. By statute, you can't get a medical license, so have to be kind of careful with those. Um, but I, I don't think it, uh, it immediately precludes you, but it can, especially academic dishonesty is a very difficult one to overcome. I would add at a &M, what we do is we, we don't consider it during the initial process, but during the, if you're invited for an interview, uh, we have it, we set aside a special third interview for you to discuss any of those, op, those uh, events. And what we're looking for is that you've understood what happened. You uh, accepted whatever uh, sanction there was for that and that you, you've learned from it. And uh, honestly, I think for a lot of students or a lot of applicants, it can be a learning experience, an enriching experience uh, in, in some ways. That's, that's kind of how we look at it at Long School of Medicine. Um, it could be a deal breaker, but what, we have um, interviewed people with violations on their record we're looking for an explanation of that growth of remorse of recognizing you know that you made a mistake made the wrong choices and that you're um, committed to doing better now so um we luckily everybody lots of us human beings get second chances um that it can be a tough situation but uh, we do the same thing and not with an additional interview but it it might come up in an interview setting because you've put it in your application to explain it more um, when the description and the application is very clinical and just said here was the violation and the consequences that I did, period, that does not make an impression on the committee. We're really looking for um, a change. Well, thank you for that. Um, we had a follow-up question with regards to acceptances. Uh, here's uh, one of those uh, I heard, I heard from a friend. Uh, that uh, schools will still offer acceptances up until orientation. I think this is a follow-up to the question regarding the movement uh, on the wait list. Uh, is this a rumor or a myth? No. No, nope. literally until the day the class yeah. starts. Yeah. All right. And um, we are pretty caught up here with questions. Let me make sure we haven't missed anything yet. Uh, this was a follow-up question regarding the application. Um, if, uh, if an applicant submits their application, can they come back and add schools after submitting? Yes, you absolutely can uh, add or remove, uh, withdraw your application from schools after submitting. Uh, here's another. Uh, with the changes to step one becoming pass fail and the likely new emphasis on step two, uh, I was wondering if your schools plan to tweak the curriculum, if at all, to account for the shift. Great question. Well, I, I, I don't want to monopolize the time here, so stop me if I would do, but uh, I literally just got out of a meeting for our, our preclinical curriculum, and our students have proposed a change to our curriculum to address uh, this. Um, what we're seeing is that since we've gone to pass-fail, um, step one scores, are the pass rate's not as high as it used to be. And so we're actually looking to change our curriculum a little bit to address that, uh, probably moving a little bit of content over into um, the, the uh, basic science content over into the clinical side so that it's more, it's closer uh, temporally to step two. Um, again, that just literally started at 1030 this morning. Uh, so we have a long, long way to go on those changes. I could say, um, I think the one thing that we've done um, is 
explore more opportunities for students to um, uh, set themselves apart. And so we've um, expanded our options um, for different types of distinction programs that we offer. Um, so the students not only are having more of a personalized experience, but um, have different ways of distinguishing themselves um, moving forward for residency applications and, and those kinds of things. So um, that's something that we've done. Our curriculum happens to have some flexibility in that time right after the pre-clerkship curriculum is completed, um, leading up until that step one. And so a lot of our students um, the from March through June do all kinds of things after they get step one out of the way. Um, but there's flexibility to do it actually later. And so we haven't had, we haven't made any big changes because it, seems to be working so far so yeah we're different because we require the complex but actually a large number of our students too did take usmle so um now with step one i don't think that will always be the case since it's pass fail with what is going to be the value of that it's been a question mark but we've already had students take step two and actually do pretty well um that have taken it in the past. So we'll see how that, I think more students will be doing that at our school, taking the step two. And right now I don't see any major changes, if any changes, because it seems like the performance has been reasonably steady for us. So, um, but that's a really good question to ask the question. Um, all I know is I know a number of residency directors and they're all just scratching their heads over this one, how they're gonna pick their students. So <laughs> that'll be the that'll be the trick for the next coming, coming uh, residency cycles. We haven't changed anything at this time, but we're continuing to reevaluate things. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a couple more questions, and then I'll give you all uh, an opportunity to just extend some uh, words of wisdom for our applicants. Uh, our second to last question here is research experience weighed heavily uh, uh, when considering applicants? So we certainly uh, look at meaningful research opportunities, meaning uh, above and beyond uh, an activity that might be part of coursework that one's taking. Um, but it is not a requirement of uh, what we review applications. And if there's no uh, research, um, you know, it's not a, uh, nothing's taken away from, from the applicant. I do think it's a great opportunity uh, to pursue um, uh, a scientific investigation and, and, and benefit from it, but it's not a requirement in, for our applicants. Anybody? We love research. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I interrupt somebody? Nope. Okay. So uh, we love it. It's not a requirement. There are so many ways to be a great doctor at the end of your medical education. There are so many things that you can do. Um, we might see someone with no research, some healthcare, but tons of community service. And we realize that your path might lead you there. And so you might be um, an excellent physician who works with communities or in public health. Um, same thing, we might see less of community service or healthcare, but see tremendous work in research. Well, that's gonna be your thing maybe. You're gonna be um, an excellent physician who does science and discovery. So it's sort of individualized. We don't need, you know, we don't need to see all the boxes checked or anything where it, it's, we consider it part of your individual path. Yeah, we're very much like what Dr. Kellaway said. And I mean, they're gonna be people who bring in research to the table because they really enjoy it. So, and that's important. Uh, I would really encourage undergraduates, if you wanna do research, or if you're a graduate student, do it because you love to do it. Um, don't worry about if it's gonna get you into medical school um, because we're interested if we, when you get excited about something, if it's a service activity or shadowing or research, it shows up on your applications, particularly or on your interview day or throughout the time you're interacting with us in the process. And that's what we really wanna know. What is the thing that excites you? And then that's the part where we try to figure out hey, are you a good fit for us with that excitement? Can we see that being here in our campus um, and growing that out? 
I'm going to sneak one more question in for Dr. Calloway. Could you explain the secondary video interview for long? Yes. Okay. So um, we don't really call it a secondary. So no secondaries from Long School of Medicine. Um, we do ask everybody now to do the SOV, the standardized one-way video interview. We use a platform called Smart, Smart, I'm sorry, Spark Hire. This arose because every week at committee, many times people would say, this is a wonderful applicant. And the other committee members would say, I'm so sorry, I didn't get a chance to meet this person and talk to them. And this standardized one-way uh, video interview is a way for everybody to sort of see you in action answering two simple questions. Or, um, I love the second question because without exception, people light up because I think we ask something like, tell us some accomplishment of which you're most proud. You know, what's your proudest moment? And so people just beam and tell us about that. Um, that's always a fun two minutes to listen to. And I can't remember the other one, but it's very it's very standard and it's not a secret. I can give it to you if you're interested. Um, but that allows all of the committee members to see everybody again in another standardized situation. And almost without exception, it adds a positive piece to the person's application. Mm -hmm. We let you look at it and look at all of the intro and information uh, and preparation advice first, and you can do it then, or you can come back. You can come back in two weeks. You can come back with notes. You know, we just want a little bit of a prepared answer. Um, we just kind of want to see you in action, you know, for those of us who missed you at the interview. Thank you. And since uh, Long doesn't have a secondary application, but the other schools here do, uh, any advice for applicants as they complete the secondary application for your school? Ours is pretty straightforward, so I don't know if there's any particular advice for you. But I, I you know, I told you earlier there's an integrity essay at the end. I would take time probably to look at that and think about a response to it it's optional and certainly if you don't want to fill it out that's fine but um but if you uh some of our committee members are always kind of interested to see what you would write down there so you might want to take a little bit of time on that one don't on our secondary is is similar to that we have an integrity like question at the end it's not optional and a lot of our folks uh on the committee take it serious very seriously uh, but the other thing I want, the main point I want to say was don't rehash your primary essays in your secondary essays. They should all be unique. I mean, I, the only thing I would add or uh, mention is we do, the secondary application is still, is very important. There's different questions. There's two of them are optional. So there's a lot of room to add or expand upon areas that, um, uh, you, you would want to. So, um, uh, you know, you need to look at the secondary application and uh, you may not, you don't need to fill out all the questions except for the required ones, um, but it really gives the applicant uh, a lot of um, opportunity to address anything that might be missing in the, the primary application. Mm -hmm. You should always fill out every question that ever gets asked of you because you're selling yourself. And you know you get so many opportunities to do it, you should use them. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Perry, to put you on the spot, any advice for uh, applicants completing secondary for Foster? Sure. We, uh, I mean, we put a lot of weight on our secondaries. Um, I think every school that has a secondary designed it with very specific questions that their committees are um, going to weigh, they weigh heavily and they choose specific questions that are more relevant to their program. So um, set aside time in your process for the secondaries. Don't look at them as an afterthought. Um, we can tell <laughs> when you approach it that way and um, don't cut and paste. We see that too. So. Yeah. All righty. Well, uh, we have reached the end of our panel today. Thank you all for uh, such incredible, thoughtful responses. Uh, and uh, for those of you that are watching, and thank you all for uh, some fantastic questions that helped direct our conversation today. Uh, 
for our panel, uh, any advice you'd like to share uh, for applicants for entry year 23 that's starting in a, about a week and a half? Well, I mean, I've, I've practiced medicine now for almost, well, for 40 years. So um, I really think, uh, you know, it's a very challenging career, but it's, it's wonderful. Um, it, um, I think you personally need to sit back and make sure the motivation comes from your own heart, that you have a realistic idea of what becoming a physician is. And, and there's obviously an unlimited number of career pathways within medicine. So that's another advantage, but um, it's really rewarding. But I think the first step, I encourage you to really self-reflect and is this what you want? A lot of it's absolutely wonderful. And it's also extremely challenging. Not all like that you see on the glitter on TV. Um, uh, and so uh, it's wonderful that you're interested in medicine. Uh, so it's a very exciting time in many different aspects uh, to serve humanity. And I encourage you, if you come to the conclusion that you want to pursue this career, it's wonderful. It can be wonderful. I would say hang in there. It's long. It's hard. The cycle is long. Can we do anything about that? Um, it's just, I mean, from it's almost a year, right? Um, oh, no, it's over a year, really, technically. When you, anyway, hang in there. You know, um, we're all here to help you with questions and, um, you know, coaching along the way. If you need help, all of our schools do that. But uh, hang in there. Have some, have some inspiration at hand so that when you are in a little dip, you can like re-motivate yourself and, and um, pump yourself up for this because it, it's worth it. It's all worth it in the end. Yeah. Great. Right. Well, again, thank you all so much uh, for your time and for, for such great insightful answers. Uh, on behalf of all of our medical member institutions, the Texas Health Education Service and TMDSAS, We'd like to wish each of you all the best of luck in this next application cycle. And as we have repeated several times, uh, we are happy to be a resource to you as you complete your application and continue your journey toward becoming a physician. So thank you so much, and we will see you soon. Bye, everyone.